All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're now going to start our next uh, plenary session for Industry Day. If you wouldn't mind taking our seats, and uh, we can uh, make uh, our progress uh, forward on our, the proceedings. So I'd like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I hope you really enjoyed that first uh, industry award to Jeff Bezos and the really interesting things that Blue Origin is doing, as well as that really fantastic announcement of the national team and uh, how these four companies are coming together to go back to the moon to stay. I am Robbie Samantha Roy. I am the chair of the Industry Relations Committee of the IAF, as well as my day job is the VP for Technology in our Government Affairs uh, Office for Lockheed Martin Corporation, the anchor sponsor for this Congress. So again, thank you so much for attending and I'm really looking forward to having a, an amazing industry day. Before we start, I'd like to make a shout out to some of my colleagues because the Industry Relations Committee has done an amazing job over the last four years ensuring that Industry Day is able to bring a broad spectrum of very interesting technical, business, and policy-related issues that are relevant to the hearts of the future of space. I have to give a shout out to my two co-vice chairs. We have Mark Mulqueen from Boeing and Clay Maury from uh, Blue Origin as well as all of my other colleagues on the IRCs, um, the Industry Relations Committee. If you wouldn't mind standing, please, I'd like to give you an applause for what you've done over these last number of years. Bruce. Mary. So I'm gonna quickly go through an overview of what to expect to this day, and I hope that you're able to attend all of these various events. We're going to start with a plenary session focused on the long-term sustainability of outer space advancing the space economy and sustaining space industry through the space security aspects. It's important that the topic of space security, which is very important, is actually broached across the International Astronautical Congress community, and we're going to have a great plenary panel with the government as well as the industry members. Next, we're going to have a GNF focusing on some industry storytelling. Eric Stalmer, who is uh, with the Commercial Spaceflight Federation, is going to go through and basically curate or moderate a number of very interesting stories that various industry companies are going to tell. And these are going to be sort of rapid TED-like talks. We then are going to go through another GNF, which is a grand tour of global space policy issues that is going to be moderated by Brian Whedon of the Secure World Foundation. This is a spectrum of very interesting, relevant space policy to, uh, issues that are all of relevance to us across the community. Then we're going to break for lunch, and we have to give a thank you to Boeing. Uh, they're sponsoring the industry lunch, and uh, Congresswoman Kendra Horn will be our speaker. So stay tuned for some interesting discussions there. Then in the afternoon, we are going to have uh, essentially a, another plenary focused on building and sustaining the global space workforce. That's going to be moderated by Clementine de Koopman of the SGAC. This is going to be an interesting panel talking about the future of the workforce for the global space community. And then we will have another GNF that is going to be focused on Boeing's commercial crew Starliner that uh, Boeing's VP Jim Chilton will be moderating followed by two other GNFs. We will have an industry deep dive session that's going to be moderated by Lockheed Martin's Joe Langdon. So there'll be some interesting discussions about new emerging technologies and, and companies. And then we'll have our final GNF, which is really for the second time in the Congress, we will have our startup pitch session. So we will be introduced to a number of emerging startup companies that you'll see interesting technologies that are emerging in sort of the venture capital funded arena. And uh, Lynn Zunin from iSpace will actually be sort of, if you will, the master of ceremonies. And lastly, we'll conclude the day with a fascinating lecture um, on the search for liquid water on Mars by Professor Enrico Flamini, uh, formerly of the Italian Space Agency. So ladies and gentlemen, this is really an action-packed uh, agenda that I hope you will all uh, appreciate. Now what I'd like to do is quickly turn over to this, our first plenary panel focused on space security. Just to say a few words about this upcoming panel with some amazing people. Number one, space security is a very important topic because as we know, in all areas of human endeavor, 
we have to have areas of laws and of governance, rules, regulations, and how do these policy and legal considerations, if you will, guide, if you will, security considerations, economic development, and ultimately, because inevitably history shows us, conflict resolution. So who better to actually be able to moderate a panel than basic, basically Fatih uh, Osman, who is the CEO of, of uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation. And so Fatih and his wife, Erin, uh, have developed a very, the largest actually female-owned aerospace and, and defense company in the United States. And they are going to actually talk about and moderate a lot of these policy issues with this panel. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll really enjoy the security issues that are discussed. And let me give you a welcome first to basically uh, Fatih as he come on board and moderate this panel. Fatih, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Samantha Roy, for this very kind of introduction. As VP of Technology Strategy at Innovation at Lockheed Martin, we very much appreciate you being here today. And thank you for all you do to advance science and technology, not only for Lockheed, but all you do for defense, NASA, industry partners, and higher education, and spark a new interest in high tech through innovative ways, such as your partnership with the Drone Racing League. Welcome everyone for this plenary today on the topic of the long-term sustainability of outer space, advancing the space economy and sustaining space industry through solutions to space security. It's a long name, however, it's really there are three basic parts to this that we are going to talk about today, three questions to our uh, esteemed panelists today. First focus on the policy, second one on economy, and the third topic is the security, which is very important. So all those three basic threads go hand in hand. So with this uh, uh, introduction, I'd like to talk about uh, our very distinguished panelists here. But uh, I also want to thank you, the IAC, for the opportunity to engage this panel uh, on this topic of very exciting times. Humanity has become truly dependent on space capabilities and space-enabled services. Commerce, the human condition, and our daily lives are dependent on information that is from and through space, and we are vulnerable to any significant disruption of space assets. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing and the 70th anniversary of the IAC, there has been so much change during the last half century and we are now facing a new space economy that's emerging rapidly toward the two to three trillion dollar size in the next 20 years. Further, the information age has arrived and empowered billions of people to connect and space technologies like GPS, communication and Earth's observation satellites have transformed our lives. After the half a century that passed since the moon landing, we are at the crossroads right now as other new technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, 3D printing, nanotechnology, 5G, new materials, biomedical, molecular, and new nuclear energy solutions are advancing very rapidly. And in addition, the barriers to entry are lowering. Projections for the next five to 10 years include mega constellations with a total of over 10,000 plus satellites in orbit. Their mining, tourism, and several other industries are evolving. And while we use the Earth-based analogies to relate space to our oceans, we have serious problems with immediate effect with pollutants like debris in Earth orbit. And we might just discuss today the applicability of the public good and global commons arguments. We are now facing a potential confluence of events. The 
United States government right now is tracking over 1,430 satellites, 20,000 pieces of human-generated debris at 10 centimeter plus size, and there are also said to be about 500,000 pieces at 1 to 10 centimeter size, each of which could damage or destroy an active satellite. There are serious threats in addition to all these very crowded space that we are dealing with, like the 2017 event when Chinese anti-satellite test and the 2009 collusion of the Iridium and the Cosmos satellites. The space debris and the space traffic management challenges are increasing based on rapidly growing new space economy. And there have been many proposed policies and a lot of those have failed. So there are new proposals about sustainable management and ownership of common pool resources. Core resources like water, air, fish, forests that can provide benefits is an analogy that we can draw to space perhaps. However, there are uh, security issues that involve in terms of maintaining this kind of emergent space economy that we really need to also take into account. So the result of all this environment that we have not faced before could either be a new world order in space or a new world chaos. So today is a very important day to discuss this problem. And there are really, as I said earlier, there are three threats in our <coughs> plenary today. As uh, policy is going to drive a lot of these problems and as well as the solutions associated with them. Are there current international space policies enough to guide us into the future it is the first question that we have to deal with. In summary, for space economy, do we have viable and sustainable economic development in space that is truly transform transformational to our society? Or is this just a flash in the pan and fueled currently by superpowers and billionaires? And uh, the last but not the least uh, is very critical, the security part of the equation that we have to deal with because there are threats that has to be taken into account along with all the opportunities that we are dealing with. So what are those threats that we need to be aware of? And what norms and behavioral changes do we need to make as nations or consortiums for the freedom of action and sustainable space economy? So with this, is you know why we have the, the panel of experts is the way that they are composed because uh, they, have, they are the leading experts who dedicated their careers and lives in industry and also government to advance space technology for the protection and security of humankind. So we are very fortunate and, and, uh, and I feel very honored and privileged to have our panel today. The, the, our panel members here starting with Scott Pace, and I'd like to do a brief introduction for them. It won't do any justice because there's so much depth and, and capabilities that our panelists have uh, contributed to the society and to our uh, uh, community and the humankind as well. Is, uh, but very briefly, Dr. Scott, Scott Pace, since 2017, has served as executive director for the National Space Council, which is, uh, as you most of you heard, yesterday opening Vice President Pence's chairing, which is a very important construct for the United States because it is bringing the whole of government approach and, and dealing with some of these major topics that we are going to discuss today. Scott was formerly the Director of Space Policy Institute and a professor at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. He also served at NASA, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, RAND, and the Department of Commerce. He was a private sector advisor to the U.S. delegation to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. Our next panelist here is uh, equally important from the European and international side. Atien is the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy and Space along with the Health Minister for the Luxembourg government since 20, 2018. We have on the... Uh, before his current job, 2013 to 2018, ATN served as the Luxembourg's Minister of Defense. He also served as Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Economy and Foreign Trade, and was a municipal councillor. 
In addition, he has an entrepreneur and private background, industrial background that at and you may want to expand on, which makes him uh, even more unique to qualify to talk about policy effects on industry and the economy as well. So our next uh, panelist, are, uh, Dan Goldberg here, and Dan is uh, the president and chief executive officer of Telesat. He, Telesat is a leading global satellite operator providing communication services to broadcast telecom, corporate, and government customers throughout the world. So prior to joining to Telesat in 2006, Mr. Goldberg served as a CEO of New Sky Satellites and then SCS New Skies, along with the chief operating officer and general counsel roles. And he, that also makes him uniquely qualified about the space economy and, and the effect of uh, the policy on the future growth. Jean-Luc Gall, and he gave me the permission to pronounce, to, to be able to mispronounce his name because they mispronounced my name. So I understand how that may go. But Jean-Luc is the president and CEO of Talos Elenia Space France. In Talos, he was a senior vice president Space, the senior vice president of uh, air operations, CEO of Talos Raytheon Systems France, and general manager, military avionics. He was also, <coughs> excuse me, Sexton's manager of mergers and acquisitions, along with their helicopter avionics division and uh, business unit. Our last panelist here is the, our resident expert on the security discussion. And Kay Sears is the Vice President of Strategy and Business Development for Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company. Kay leads strategic planning and advanced technology concepts and new business acquisition efforts. Prior to joining Lockheed Martin, Kay also served as President of Intelsat General, which again makes her uniquely qualified to be on both sides of the fence, both the commercial and security side of the equation that uh, will be very valuable for our discussion today. Kay also worked government services business units at both the G2 Satellite Solutions and Veristar. So let's get started with our questions. Given the extreme breadth and scope of this issue, both domestically and internationally, I'd like to begin with the views of Scott Pace, Executive Director, National Space Council, and Etienne Schneider, Minister of Economy and Space, Luxembourg. So Scott and Etienne, space is often referred to as shared or common uh, or global commons. However, norms and rules of global commons of international waters on our oceans, for example, may not be directly applicable to space. Are there, <clears throat> are there norms, guidelines, or best practices that can be used for sovereign and international territory in space? What additional policies we need and how do we proceed? Scott, you may want to go first and we will follow up. We each have 10 minutes for each question, roughly speaking, and we will have some little extra time discussion if needed toward the end. And so, all right, this is on, thank you. Uh, so first of all, um, as a recovering academic, I'll start to question the question and, uh, and point out that uh, there really can't be international territory in space because the 1967 Outer Space Treaty uh, you know, says that we don't have sovereignty in space. So we have what nations decide to agree and do with each other, uh, but we don't have sovereign claims. Um, on the other hand, um, some of the terms that are often used, like global commons and common pool resources and so forth, uh, they're wonderful metaphors, and so to give people the understanding that this is an area that uh, shared space that everyone is operating in, but actually from a legal standpoint, they're really problematic. And from a US perspective, we don't really see space as a global commons. A global commons is something which people agree among nations is going to be a common. So for example, the high seas, the air above the high seas that are governed by the UN uh, Convention on Law of the Sea, that's a global commons that we've agreed to. So space might become a global commons at some point, or some portion of space, like say, you know, the moon or s such, could be agreed to uh, in that way. Um, but it really doesn't happen automatically, I think, the way some people like to think. Uh, the common pool resource idea is a slightly different economic idea, such as like shared fisheries or so forth, uh, shared forest land. Again, the sovereign states can come to an agreement on. So I think what, as we look going forward, we have the fundamental reality of lack of sovereignty in space. 
yet we have a greater number of countries operating in space uh, and we have a greater number of private sector entities operating in space. So one of the things the Vice President said yesterday was to talk about how do we create a more stable and predictable and supportive international environment when we, we really are, are going to have these uncertainties around it. Uh, some people have said that we should negotiate a new treaty uh, to govern all these things, but if anyone, of course, has in, been in that process, you know that really takes decades, um, or can take decades, and that the space community is really evolving much more rapidly uh, than you really could have traditional treaty-making processes. And also, it, it changes so rapidly that almost anything you do might be really out of date fairly soon. So instead, what the United States and other countries have done is to work to develop best practices, norms of behaviors, voluntary guidelines, things that are really non-binding, and that proceed from technical best practices rather than trying to create overarching political solutions. So, for example, uh, we have guidelines on the mitigation of orbital debris that were developed outside in the technical community, but then were brought into the UN, into COPUS, and were then adopted as a voluntary guideline. As that's adopted then by the General Assembly as a broad consensus, we then work with other countries to make sure that their own national law and regulation reflects those guidelines and others. And so we focus on the nation state as the sovereign entity, not a transnational structure, and that within those nation states we work with them to try to build their own capacities. So countries uh, may have very highly developed legal structures like the United States, where we still need, of course, to do more. Other countries may be very lightly developed and they want to do more. Uh, but I think we found that we can make more progress more rapidly uh, by working at the national level for implementation, but working at the multilateral level for understanding the changes that are coming around. Uh, probably the cutting edge area right now is going to be satellite servicing. Uh, so things like uh, rendezvous and proximity operations, norms of behavior for how those should be governed, uh, that's probably the cutting edge item that we're looking to the technical community to do and as they come to a consensus, we'll then bring that into the UN uh, system for discussion. No, that's a very good point, especially the last point that you made, because that directly affects the space economy in terms of servicing and, and making the space even more viable. But uh, for space traffic management issues and, and uh, all the UN conventions, the, for instance, the TCBM, types of things that are going to be very important in terms of transparency and being able to monitor these complex uh, space that we are dealing with. It's a new evolving area. But uh, Etienne, uh, you are from the European perspective. We would like to see how you see this international challenge that we have to deal with uh, on the policy front. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe first of all, I, sh I should explain a little bit why tiny Luxembourg uh, with barely 1,000 square miles is, is investing uh, into space and why we are really at the forefront in the European Union uh, uh, concerning the development of, of space resources and space resource activities. Uh, you know, when I, when I became Minister of the Economy in 2012, I, you know, we had a diversification strategy for our economy. Uh, being a country which is largely depending on its uh, financial center, we tried to develop other uh, economic sectors like um, health technologies, uh, like logistics, like automotive, uh, ICT, and, and, and different other ones. But, you know, I, I, I've, when I had discussions with my European colleagues, I saw that everybody's doing the same. So everybody's trying to develop this um, uh, uh, economic sector. So I had the idea that we should really find something new and something which others don't do yet, at least not uh, in the European Union. Then I was lucky enough to meet uh, uh, with Dr. Pete Worden, who at that time was the Director General of uh, NASA Ames. And I met him actually in my office, and, um, and he was talking to me about all the new space activities, or at least about the possibilities in space. And he said, why, why, why doesn't Luxembourg try to do that? As we have a long history in space, maybe uh, you know that uh, Luxembourg is... Uh, as a government um, was at the, um, or decided in the early 80s to put in place a, a satellite uh, company called SES, where the Luxembourg government is still uh, one of the major shareholders. And, uh, you know, at that time it was quite difficult to do so because nobody really believed in the use of this TV satellites. But we did it and we took high risk at the time uh, as, as a government. 
So he said, you know, you have a long history in space, so why shouldn't you do that? Why shouldn't you go for uh, new space activities? Why shouldn't you go uh, for this uh, kind of space mining activities, etc.? And, you know, at that time when, I, when he was talking to me, I mean, he, he explained all these new opportunities to me, I, I thought two things. First of all, what did the guy smoke before coming to your office? And, uh, and second, how do I get him out of here? Uh, but he stayed, and he's still there. And uh, by the way, yesterday was his 70th birthday, so uh, uh, happy birthday to him. So, you know, I, I thought that that could really be something interesting. And then I um, really got in touch with many uh, new space companies in order to see what do these companies need? What do they need in order to be interested to do business from uh, Luxembourg? And one of the most uh, important issues was, uh, like Scott was mentioning as well, was the legal framework. You know, if you, if you are, have an idea about uh, you know, grabbing resources in space and commercializing them, but there's no legal framework which allows you to do so. You know, if the United Nations Treaty dating back to 1967 says that everything in space belongs to humankind, that's not really a good business model. So we uh, actually saw what the United States did, the United States law about uh, space activities, and we did more or less, uh, or we put in place more or less in uh, the same uh, regulation in Luxembourg, with one difference, I think in the US you need to have majority American capital, US capital, in order to, to, to be covered by the law. In Luxembourg we never cared about where the money came from, so we are more flexible with that. But uh, nonetheless, you know, it was important to put in place such a legal framework which allows these companies to do business and which helps them also to find venture capital because nobody is investing into a company where you're not sure that you will be able to, to possess and to commercialize whatever you find uh, in, in space. But then, you know, we put in place research and development funds uh, for these uh, companies. We put in place the Luxembourg Space Agency. We didn't have any since, uh, but we have one since, since one year now. But the aim is to really help the companies, help the companies develop their activities, help them to access uh, ESA programs, etc. So that's the aim of, of our space uh, agency. We put in place master degrees at the University of of Luxembourg, um, uh, many other things, and now at the end of this year we are going to uh, launch a venture capital fund as well, you know, to invest into, uh, into these uh, companies. But uh, coming back to the main question, or you may, I, I just wanted to wrap it up a little bit so that you understand what we're doing. But coming back to your question, you know, at the beginning we thought that maybe we should change the United Nations Treaty. And we started discussions and we saw quite soon that, you know, that will be impossible, or at least that will be take ages uh, to get an agreement on changing the United Nations Treaty of 1967. So what we did is what, what, what Scott said as well, you know, trying to get the like-minded countries around the table, trying to uh, get agreements with like-minded countries in order to see how are we going to regulate these activities in space. And, uh, you know, we put in place a regulation in Luxembourg and, uh, and uh, also a supervision in Luxembourg for those companies who want to go uh, uh, to space and do business in space. But what's important to us now is really to try and figure out together with other like-minded countries how we should organize this in the long term. Uh, and, 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 and that's what we're doing now. The last agreement we signed was with the United States uh, of America. Wilbur Ross came to Luxembourg in order to sign such an agreement with Luxembourg, a cooperation agreement with Luxembourg. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud, uh, proud about that. And now today we are going to sign an agreement also with NASA in order co to cooperate with NASA. But coming back to the, European, uh, to the European situation, I was the uh, president of the ministerial uh, committee of ESA in 2014. And every time when I addressed this topic at ESA, nobody was really interested. Nobody really wanted to discuss this. They, we we all, always discussed the relationship between ESA and the European Commission, but not about you know, new space activities and, and uh, of course, the other programs which are uh, uh, done by ESA, of course, but nobody was really into thinking about new space activities. Now this is completely different. Uh, last week I had the chance to be uh, together with Jan Werner from uh, ESA, who's, uh, by the way, a great guy because he really understood 
what is possible in space uh, in the future. And we signed an agreement about uh, putting together a, a space resource research center. So Luxembourg will have such a center uh, in, in our country and ESA will be a partner of it. Uh, so that's really important. And now you see that things are really evolving uh, in Europe as well. And, and I hope that you know, United States and, and Europe will be at the forefront of these new, new developments. Sorry for being Well, I, I think it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, approach that uh, you took as a country in Luxembourg. It kind of reminds me of Sierra Nevada Corporation, entrepreneur kind of approach. You take risk, you have the vision, you're pressing forward, uh, uh, trailing, uh, blazing some new ground. But uh, uh, I'm happy to hear that Europe and the ESA and Dr. Warner, everybody else is really cooperating because at the end of the day, like you said, it's very difficult to have these treaties signed up in black and white. I think if we can work on norms of behavior and guidelines and keep some flexibility, at least have some common understanding of how to operate, we may be able to move to the future in this next era that is a lot different than the past half century that we had just been through. Uh, so I really appreciate what uh, you have done as an individual, also as the country leading the way, because these policy issues are going to be very, very critical. So with this, uh, your your vision of uh, getting in uh, earlier in that space economy and, and uh, moving to new level uh, brings up the next question for um, Dan and. Uh, um, of the, from the Telesat perspective, as well as from the uh, jean louis uh, uh, industry perspective, uh, you guys represent both sides of the spectrum in a way, operator and a provider in some respect, and, and you, both of you know each other very well. So I'd like to hear your opinion on the, the question of the economic development and, and for uh, uh, space being integrated into the global economic output and uh, this whole um, idea of um, I'm going backwards here in, in the questions but uh, the space economy being able to uh, leverage by the commercial entities like what you have done in the uh, Telesat and I'd like to see how you both see the evolving of the future space economy in the context of this major uh, policy questions that we are discussing, all the private launches, the space and uh, government uh, uh, initiatives as well. So, Dan, you may want to take the question first and how do you see the evolution of these new technologies and take us to the next level in the space economy? Yeah, okay, well, well thank you very much. Um, and, and I would say uh, uh, I thought your introduction was uh, spot on. I thought you provided a nice overview of a lot of the uh, drivers that are um, making the industry today. I think uh, the most exciting time in the last decades to be in this industry, and it's great to be sitting on a panel uh, and in a room with people that, that really care about space. The, the, you know, I'm the CEO of Telesat, so we're a, a communication satellite operator. There is so much innovation and so much uh, good development taking uh, part just kind of straight across the space sector, whether it's Earth observation, Scott mentioned uh, in-orbit servicing, uh, Etienne mentioned, I mean, there's, you know, asteroid mining, there's there's just so much going on right now. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, barely expert in satellite communication, so I, I better limit my comments to that. Uh, but it, th there is a, a huge revolution uh, undergoing right now in the field of satellite communications, and fundamentally, it's being driven, uh, I'd say sort of, you know, by demand on the one side, and that demand is for broadband connectivity just right across the world, developed countries, developing countries, and virtually every vertical you can imagine. So there's just strong, strong global demand for broadband connectivity and, and moving uh, IP traffic around. On the other hand, there's some uh, technology developments and some innovations that are taking place right now that allows those of us uh, in the space industry to play a role in that in a way that 
uh, we've never really fundamentally been able to do before. So maybe just first on the, on the demand side, we, we all see it and probably all of us have access to good broadband connectivity. Certainly, you know, the internet is just powering and transforming economies and industries and the way that people go about doing everything. Um, but there are about 3.8 billion people in the world that don't have access to good broadband connectivity. And what that means is that they're really not able to participate in the economy in a way that allows them to be effective. And this is a huge concern and a huge priority for governments all around the world. We're looking for ways to bridge that digital divide. And it's important. It's important for kids that are going to schools. It's important for farmers trying to remain competitive and adopt the most uh, modern uh, techniques. It's important in terms of delivering health care. Uh, it's important in terms of governments creating cohesive and, and socially inclusive societies. And so there's a huge challenge in getting good broadband connectivity to those other 3.8 billion people. You're not going to do it with fiber. You're not going to do it with terrestrial wireless. There's a huge opportunity for those of us in this uh, in this in this massive room uh, to, 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 to bridge that digital divide and to step into that, into that void. We've been doing it for decades, uh, mostly with geostationary satellites, uh, but there's a giant opportunity to do this much more effectively with low Earth orbit satellites. Telesat is one of a handful of other companies that's really taking the lead in developing very state-of-the-art low Earth orbit satellite constellations. The technologies that are enabling it, Fatih, are things that you highlighted. It's, it's new launch vehicles that are highly capable, it's advanced manufacturing, it's 3D printing, uh, it's optical communications, it's uh, advances in computer processing. So that's all taking place. There's, there's a great promise there that Leo can uh, uh, step into and deliver. I'll, I'll make one more point and maybe then kick over to my partner in crime, uh, Jean-Louis. Uh, but there's a, a, a huge role that public policy and regulators play in allowing us in the commercial sector to deliver on that promise. Uh, the reality is we need spectrum. This is a wireless service. As we sit here talking, we're just about to kick off a new world radio conference that takes place every four years. Vitally important decisions are going to be made there in terms of how you allocate, how regulators and administrations around the world allocate the scarce spectrum resource. In my own opinion, and I'm massively biased here, uh, the scales have tipped uh, much too heavily over the past few world radio conferences towards terrestrial wireless services. And it is vital that policymakers around the world make sure that there's adequate spectrum to allow us to make these investments and to deliver on the promise of these low Earth orbit satellites and other satellite technologies. That's, that's vitally important. And, and it's not enough to allow each country to kind of make these allocation decisions in a patchwork way, the reality is if we're going to invest the billions and billions and billions of dollars, and it is billions and billions of dollars, to deploy these constellations, we need to know they're inherently global, and we need to know that we can make use of the spectrum to serve this global market, uh, and that we have the flexibility uh, to do it and to make these long-term investments over time. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, Dan, that, that's an excellent, uh, I mean, you made several great points. And uh, when you talk about <clears throat> broadband, I was just thinking about spectrum because, uh, you know, the broader the band, yesterday, uh, one of the panels that we said, and Dr. Uh, uh, Parkinson uh, talked about GPS vulnerabilities. And like you said, and uh, Dr. Pace also pointed out earlier that uh, uh, you cannot really separate terrestrial communication from space that spectrum interference is a major problem. I know ITU is trying to tackle that problem, but uh, that coordination, the policy discussions will be very important, having the proper guidelines and proper norms and behavior at least to be able to, 
throw these things in the space with certain frequencies and, uh, and uh, other nations and other uh, uh, sovereign uh, capabilities uh, creating a major problem uh, in the spectrum front. That's a whole separate discussion, I think, probably in other panels should tackle that. But uh, this uh, follow-up question to Jean-Louis uh, is that uh, you were recently quoted talking about needing more flexibility in satellites and constellations. So what changes uh, should be um, seen the spacecraft design, placement, and constellations to truly advance the space economy and sustain space industry? Okay, thank, thank you. First, I have to say that uh, Dan being a customer, everything that he said is perfectly, <laughs> perfectly correct. Uh, yes, yes, um, I spoke about flexibility two, two weeks ago in Paris because we launched our new satellite called Space Inspire, which is a, a real breakthrough in the industry because it is the first uh, SDS satellite, uh, software-defined satellite, with a fully uh, digital payload and a fully uh, digital, uh, digital antenna. Why did we uh, do so? Uh, to answer to the uncertainty uh, that our customers are currently facing uh, as far as their market is, is concerned. You know, in the past it was easy, you all know this in, in this room, uh, uh, the market for satellite was 80% for TV broadcast, and things are changing now. This, uh, this segment of the market uh, is slowly but surely shrinking and is replaced by a lot of new segments, such as uh, broadband connectivity for consumers, as mentioned by Dan, uh, mobility for aircraft, uh, maritime mobility, and tomorrow car mobilities, and, uh, and uh, other, other, other segments such as uh, enterprise, enterprise uh, space network. So uh, we had to uh, propose to our customer a satellite that uh, could be reconfigurable in real time, depending on uh, the demand of the market on those uh, Different, uh, different segments, and it is what we did. But you will uh, tell me what is, uh, what is the link between this flexibility of, and the subject of the panel today, and I think that the link is that we are going from a pure passive space, or almost passive space, to a fully active space tomorrow, and flexibility of satellite is just an aspect uh, of it. Uh, in other words, we cannot continue uh, to send thousands of satellites in, uh, in, in space and uh, do not bother of what we are doing with those, uh, with those satellites in, in, in the future. So to answer to your question, Fatih, first, I, I would like to say that uh, industry, space industry, is already doing things. And I would like to give some example. Last year, we... Uh, set up the new Iridium constellation, which is today the, the biggest uh, telecom operation uh, in operation. Uh, 76 satellites that we uh, launch, capture, uh, and place in orbit in, uh, in less than 18 months. And it was a very difficult uh, job because we had to put those satellites very close to satellites of the former generation, and at the same time, we had to deorbit the former satellite and to put the new satellite in the network, in the new network. And this has been possible because of highly sophisticated and automated uh, conjunction uh, tool that we set up, we develop with uh, our customer Iridium in order to enable those, uh, those maneuvers. And by the way, those uh, uh, analysis uh, conjunction tools is, uh, is used, is still used by Iridium in order to avoid collisions of those uh, 76 satellites with any objects in, in space. This is the, the first example. A second example is a small satellite called SWAT, uh, which is a project between France and, and US, between uh, CNES, the Space French Agency, and NASA. It is an ocean monitoring satellite, and France, probably you don't know, has set up a law, uh, which is uh, it's called space operation law, that uh, has to be applied uh, for any satellite built in France or for 
any uh, satellite launch from France. And uh, this law says a lot of things about uh, deorbiting geo satellite in symmetry orbits. This is quite classical. But also for LEO and MEO satellites to deorbit those satellites in specific areas of, uh, of the globe where there is no population, no city, and no risk for humanity. And for the first time, we uh, embedded in the avionics of the satellite uh, the features in order to respect this uh, new French law that will enter into force in 2020. Having said that, is it enough? My uh, strong viewpoint is no, it's not enough. Uh, because, uh, as you say, uh, Fatih, uh, we know that uh, thousands, uh, let's say thousands of thousands of satellites will be launched in, in the near future, creating hundreds of thousands of debris in, uh, in the next uh, decade. And obviously, if we don't react, uh, I think that it will be a big mess. It will be a big mess in, in space. So we have to do uh, different things. I will not speak about the regulatory aspect, which is extremely important. Scott and Etienne did better, better than me. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, those, uh, those things, those uh, rules, have to be edicted uh, as much as possible as a collective effort of uh, the, main, the main space powers, the US, Europe, and every, every country who want to participate to those uh, to those regulatory uh, tools. So it is on the regulatory part, and the industry is not really involved in it. Second thing that we have to do is uh, to develop uh, an enhanced and more comprehensive SSA, Space Surveillance Awareness. In order to act in space, we have first to understand precisely what is happening in space, uh, and for this, we need, we need some tools. Uh, my company is involved in a, in a very new space uh, project, which is a Canadian project called North Star, uh, with a goal to uh, develop and to set up and to launch a constellation of 40 satellites that will uh, monitor space from space. It will be observation optical satellite, but usually the optical satellite looks downwards, here they will look upwards, and they will identify all kinds of objects from one centimeter in, in low orbits to dozens of centimeters in geo orbits, all kinds of uh, objects, and also the trajectography of those, uh, those objects. So we will launch the first satellite in 2021, and uh, we, we hope that, uh, obviously, all the big powers of the US uh, Europe, uh, Japan, will use this, uh, this new tool in order to better understand what is uh, uh, in, in space. The last thing that we have to do once we clearly understand uh, all the objects that are in, spec is, uh, in space is to act uh, and to, to collect those objects when we have to collect those objects. And obviously I'm speaking of a debris removal uh, topic. Uh, on this field, uh, we are acting, and uh, we are acting with uh, ESA, the European Space Agency. We have proposed uh, six months ago to ESA uh, a very comprehensive project, a space part, space start, which is a, a, a multi-mission uh, vehicle with uh, different applications. Uh, refueling, obviously, of, uh, of satellite in order to avoid to launch new satellite or to deorbit satellite, uh, but also, obviously, uh, grasping, capturing all the debris in all uh, in all orbits. We want to make the first uh, demonstration of this uh, of this new vehicle in 2024, so that you see it's uh, it's really tomorrow. And, uh, and I hope it, it will be uh, a big success and that uh, both commercial customers and uh, governmental customers will use those, uh, those uh, tools in order to clean a little bit space. Well, this is uh, very exciting to hear, uh, Jean-Louis, because uh, 
I mean, it seems like the Talos Alenia space is uh, leading the way in a lot of these uh, critical areas. As you mentioned, not only uh, then the connecting the humanity together and from the global perspective, but also understanding what what is going on in space, especially the last point you made from the space situation awareness perspective, being able to uh, identify and locate uh, these uh, debris from space looking down. That space traffic management piece and, and SSA is, are very critical items. Uh, I, I know that Dr. Pace in the National Space Council also work and we are moving certain functions between our Commerce Department and our uh, Defense Department uh, for that particular awareness. So that, that's uh, actually a good segue into our next uh, panelists here uh, from the security perspective because that awareness, I mean, in, in the uh, aviation domain we have system set up. We have air traffic management systems. We have uh, TCAS systems to avoid collisions. We have standards and norms and guidelines. We can have both the uh, commercial and the military operate side by side at, at most times. Space, we don't have anything like that. I mean, it is evolving very rapidly and especially in the United States, uh, we are talking about forming a space force, dealing with some of the security threats. So that's all going to start with the awareness and transparency and monitoring of what is out there first, because uh, as, as Dr. Pace pointed out, servicing satellites, how are you going to know if a satellite going near another one, an object in space, to inspect, to service, or for some other intention, perhaps, unintentional or intentional uh, kind of harm that could cause from that. So with these, um, uh, Kay has, uh, is really a leader with the international experience from the, both communications and uh, security perspective. So, okay, we discuss how the rapid space commercialization is going to require all of us change our behavior. And you're very uniquely qualified on the commercial and security side of the equation. So, the question is, uh, what are the threats that uh, we need to be aware of and how do we enhance uh, space security? Uh, which leads to the next question, uh, connected question, what norms and behaviors that uh, changes that we need to make as nations or consortiums to have the sustainable space economy and national and international security? Uh, that's a loaded question, but that is absolutely critical to realize this amazing potential that we talk about from an economic perspective and with the policy leaders in our panel here, they're trying to tackle with. So I'd like to hear your perspective on the security threats and challenges we are facing. Thank you. I do think this is an important component if we're going to talk about the long-term sustainability of space. We need to recognize that the world has changed from a military perspective uh, in space. Space is now a warfighting domain like any other domain, like the air domain or the sea domain or the cyber domain. And so with that comes uh, some interesting dynamics when we talk about space sustainability. Some of the norms that might apply commercially or to civil space agencies might not be able to apply in the military use of space. So how has that world changed? Well, I can tell you that the US uh, national defense strategy is no longer centered around a counterinsurgency type of conflict with benign space capabilities. We are actually very focused on peer or near-peer uh, space capabilities from our adversaries. Everything from the anti-satellite uh, missile that we saw the Chinese launch a few times, uh, to kinetic, other kinetic capabilities in space, to directed energy, to cyber penetration, things like that. These are all unclassified and well-known threats that now face us in space. And that is causing the US and other developed space nations and our allies to think about our mission strategies and the architecture that we're going to need in space. It also has compressed the timeline for innovation and for enhancement uh, dramatically. So where we used to approach, again, a benign space environment, we could evolve our space capabilities uh, more slowly, more cautiously, we are now looking at having to evolve in, let's say, an 18-month time frame or a 24-month time frame. 
as new threats emerge and new capabilities are deployed. So uh, at least on the US side, the DOD is thinking about how do we respond to these threats. They're doing several things. First of all, with their traditional partners uh, like Lockheed Martin, we are looking at resiliency in space. So we're rethinking how we're building our satellites, how, what are, we're putting on them in terms of sensors and capabilities. It's also really important to note that military space capabilities aren't just relied on by our warfighters, they are relied on by everybody in this room. GPS alone is used by four billion people every day. The banking industry relies on GPS, many industries rely on GPS. At Lockheed, we're building the next generation of GPS satellites and we are focused on making those resilient and more capable to the threat. And we're thinking about that with the DOD and all of our defense partners in every mission area. Think about comms, think about missile warning, uh, think about space protection. So this is a whole new um, strategy. It's requiring different architectures. And I will say it is also opening up the, I, the possibility for commercial entities to really get involved in um, delivering space capabilities into the DOD, into our, our allied uh, fight. Um, Dan mentioned the LEO satellite constellation that he's building. That could be a very important communication layer, for example, in a layered defense strategy. Um, Jean-Louis mentioned the 18-month timeline and some of the smaller satellites that they're deploying. That could be a part of the architecture. At Lockheed, we're thinking about multiple orbits, multiple sized spacecraft, we're building everything from 12U CubeSats to our um, powerhouse bus, uh, the LM2100. So this new security environment requires innovation, it requires flexible and uh, rapid ev evolution of capability. It's opening up to commercial processes and commercial partnerships, um, leveraging our allied um, partners uh, for, for additional capability. So it's really kind of a layered defense. And it requires all of us to change. Um, it requires all of us to innovate new manufacturing capabilities, uh, the use of 3D printing, for example, to speed schedule, the use of automated intelligence, uh, and machine-to-machine -machine learning. All of those technologies are gonna be critical to, say, to stay within this decision-making time frame that we have to do now with how rapid these threats are approaching. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up to some discussion around that, but I think this is a really critical element of long-term space sustainability. Well, that's, uh, thank you for an excellent characterization of uh, what we are dealing with in terms of both threats and opportunities and especially the points you made regarding collaboration with the commercial side of uh, the technology and, and the providers uh, as well as the defensive side, <clears throat> because that goes back to our policy question, but, uh, but it's been an excellent uh, discussion so far. We haven't uh, really covered so many other critical things that require a lot more uh, discussions and, and, uh, and thought. Uh, however, as we close this panel, we are at the end of our hour, we have a few more minutes left, so I'm gonna ask one set of closing comments from each one of you before we conclude, but uh, we cover both the uh, uh, economic uh, security perspective as well as the policy perspective, so at least our audience know how serious this problem is, how important it is for all, us, all of us to work together, and internationally, globally, because we are into a new era. I mean, last half a century went pretty fast, and it's very different. I, I look at next half a century, if somebody's sitting here 50 years from now looking back, I think it's gonna be a whole different place and, and ball game and uh, the world out there from policy management, communication, uh, uh, interaction perspective. So my hope is that for humanity, it's all gonna uh, work well. I think we have made amazing process. So I wanna thank each one of you again for wonderful uh, comments that you made, but uh, uh, I can start uh, for your closing comments before we finish our excellent hour uh, here. Dan? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief only to say that uh, we are on the, the cusp of, a, of, of an extraordinarily exciting time in the space industry. 
Uh, there's so much promise in terms of new technologies and innovations and commercial opportunities. Uh, we all need each other. Uh, we're, you know, a satellite operator, we're going to invest billions and billions of dollars. We need our supply chain uh, to take risks with us uh, and innovate. Uh, we need our, our policy makers to make sure that we've got the right uh, regulatory and policy framework so that we can make these investments and uh, realize the great promise that uh, commercial satellites uh, offer the world today. Wonderful. Thank you. Etienne? So uh, I agree with uh, uh, Daniel, but you know, I, I, I also see a great future, bright future in, in space, and I think we are only at the very beginning of uh, what will be possible in space and what humanity will realize in space. The only thing I want to say is, and, and that's something which is important to us in our development in Luxembourg as well, is ethics. Ethics in space is something we are caring a lot about because we think that uh, we should not, you know, copy the same mistakes in space than we did during industrialization on, on our planet over here. So space debris, which you mentioned, is a huge problem and will become an even uh, a bigger problem in the years to come. So we should really try to, um, to do it in a peaceful way, of course, uh, but also in a, in, a, in a sustainable way. So trying really to build up this new space economy in a very sustainable way and accessible to all humankind. That uh, seems to be quite important to us and that's why we have working groups uh, in Luxembourg uh, uh, about space ethics as well. And I would, I would uh, wish that every country would uh, uh, try to look that uh, aspect as well. Thank you. Well, we are, thank you. We are going to rely on Luxembourg for the future ideas and vision. So thank you for all your contributions and uh, what you have done. Uh, Dr. Pace, uh, you have been also wonderful helping pull together this very challenging problem. And uh, I know the, our administration is uh, looking at this very seriously. So what are your uh, closing comments? Sure. Thank you. Um, I would say really two things. One uh, is to think about uh, the people who are not in this room. Um, there are people who would certainly benefit from space who are not always you know, represented or thought about here. Uh, there are people for whom they're competing with space. We mentioned earlier about uh, the ITU business and, and the pendulum swinging uh, between terrestrial broadband and space and so forth. Um, and uh, the space community can't take its position for granted. Uh, simply because it does wonderful things doesn't mean that the regulatory process is going to support them. And uh, one of the things that we've done, uh, there's a presidential memorandum on spectrum. As you know, 5G is a top priority of the administration. We're going to be fighting really hard to make more 5G spectrum available, of course, at the ITU. But the other thing that the memorandum talks about is the importance of having space as part of that ecosystem. That there are many people around the country, uh, in the United States itself, in rural areas, but especially in developing world, who are not going to be reached by traditional terrestrial uh, broadband systems. So we need to have a mixed strategy that includes space as part of the solution for 5G and as part of the needs of developing countries. And that leads to my second comment, which is the actually very deep alignment of interest between developed space uh, communities such as the United States and the needs of developing countries. Because the kinds of infrastructure that, that, that Kay mentioned and that you provide, uh, communications, navigation, weather, communication, these things are all really of vital interest to the developing world. Without these things, their economies and their infrastructures are in deep, deep trouble. And so one of the contributions that I think uh, the, the developed uh, space communities can make is working with the UN, working with developing uh, countries to uh, expand their own capabilities and make them partners uh, in this development. Uh, so whether it's communications and navigation, all these things, whether it's future activities uh, such as use of off-planet resources, uh, these are all things that have to be done not just within the space community but also with people who are not necessarily in this room. And uh, that's going to be our, one of our bigger challenges as we go ahead uh, is to just get beyond ourselves. Uh, you're right on. And, and that's very um, uh, actually encouraging, the, the, the fact that we are looking at these uh, issues and, and the solutions. And I'm. Uh, very optimistic for the future. We have a lot of challenges, but I think if we have these kind of dialogue and, and, and incorporate different opinions, we have hope to be able to get through this next phase. So uh, with that, again, Kay, uh, your wonderful feedback and from the security perspective made us realize how serious this problem is. It is multidimensional. So what are your uh, last words? 
I, I think it's, a, it's an incredible time to be in the space business. Um, not just the commercial and economic potential for space, but even in the national security space arena, it's an exciting time uh, to be in space because it's challenging. There are new challenges that we face every day that we are um, trying to meet and develop uh, new solutions and new capabilities. And that requires uh, commercial thinking, it requires innovation, it requires partnerships. Um, so I, I think there is also an alignment between the military use of space and this idea of peaceful use of space. These, these capabilities that we are building and developing and deploying are to deter and to keep space a peaceful environment. That is the objective and so uh, there is an alignment there in terms of the peaceful use of space and the debris, uh, the minimization. So I just ask for your partnership. I ask you for innovation, innovative ideas, and um, I think it's very exciting time. As Dan said, we all need each other. Thank you, Kay. And Jean-Louis? I, I, I do think that, uh, as was said by my colleagues, uh, space is, uh, is amazing, is a fantastic uh, arena. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, even they don't know it, the space will take uh, more and more importance in uh, the daily life of, of uh, all citizens in all countries. And, and moreover, I'm convinced that space is, uh, is the future of, uh, of humankind. Having said that, there are some threats, uh, and uh, we have to take into account those threats. We have to manage them for, uh, to achieve a peaceful, uh, a peaceful, and clean uh, space, so we we have to care about to take care of uh, of space, which is the future of humanity. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, final comment, and and that uh, I totally agree with you that cooperation, global cooperation, will be very critical. We have examples. Actually, space set one of the first examples with ISS working with multiple countries in a peaceful manner including Russia and others. Uh, so I hope that uh, this will go into the deeper space and, uh, and our uh, ability to help the humanity to uh, really transform and, and inspire our next generation as well here, which is uh, very important uh, uh, for our uh, uh, future. So with this, uh, I'd like to thank each one of you again for your wonderful comments. It's been a wonderful hour. I hope that uh, the audience enjoyed it as well, as you can uh, see that uh, there are more questions to answer than the answers we provided here. But I think it's just the beginning, and thank you very much for everyone here, and thank you for the audience being part of this wonderful session. Thank you.